brought your Bibles this morning, go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. Amen. Lord, open our hearts this morning. Open our minds that we may receive your word this morning. Father, I pray that as we consume your word, your bread of life, your daily bread today, God, would it just nourish us spiritually, physically, mentally, God. We ask that you would speak directly to our hearts, Lord, to our spirits, God. We don't just want to know about you. We don't just want to know about your gifts, God. We want to know you. We want to know the giver of the gift. So, Father, speak through me. Use me. Pray that your word would manifest itself in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so last week we started our spiritual gifts series, and uh, I'm going to call the series Cairo because uh, the root word for many of the things we'll be talking about is the Greek root Cairo. And last week uh, I taught on finding your charisma, which charisma is one of the 12 words that Cairo is a root of, and charisma means gift in the Greek. And so I can't promise we're going to go through all 12. Maybe we will, but for now we're going to hit a few. So last week was charisma. Um, This week I'm going to call the message Desire the Gifts. And we're going to pick up right where we left off last week. Um, And if you remember how we ended last week in 1 Corinthians 14.1, Paul is, he's talked about the gifts in 1 Corinthians 12. He talks about love in 1 Corinthians 13 and how even if you're gifted, it doesn't matter if you don't have love. If you don't have love, if you don't love the Lord, if you don't love others, it doesn't matter what your gift is. No one is going to be excited to receive your gift or hear your gift or feel your gift or whatever that might look like if you don't love them. And, um, and so then he moves right into 14 and he's going to talk about order and we'll, we'll hit these chapters in an in a upcoming week. Um, but I really just want to lay a foundation last week and this week on on how we interact with the gifts, where they come from, what we are to do as stewards and carriers of these gifts. And so in 1 Corinthians 14, 1, Paul says, pursue love. So I just imagine in, in my mind this big heart running down the road, and I'm chasing after it. <laughs> that might not be how you read the Bible, but that is how I read the Bible, and it makes sense in my mind. So you're, you're pursuing love. You're chasing after it. It's what you desire. It's not, a, it's not a something where you're just sitting there and then all of a sudden love hits you and you're like, oh, wow, what's this? Oh, it's love. No, pursue it. If you don't have love for someone, pursue it. I'll say that again. If you don't love someone, the Lord tells us to love him and love others. Pursue love. If you have animosity with someone, pursue love. We're good at pursuing conflict. It's easy to point at someone and say, well, I can justify why I don't like you. You know, I don't like the shoes you're wearing. You know, I don't like the way you dress. I don't like the way you talk to me. We can justify that, but we can also justify why we should love someone because they're made in his image. They're covered in the blood. They're a sinner saved by grace just like you are, just like I am. We can pursue love. So Paul tells us pursue love and then what? earnestly desire the spiritual gifts. I'm not really sure how a cessationist or someone who believes that the gifts don't exist anymore can justify that phrase right there. If Paul is saying earnestly desire the gifts, this is not just like a passing phrase of like, hey, think about the gifts every once in a while. He says earnestly desire them. Those are two very strong words. Passionately desire them, pursue them, chase them down, think about them, meditate on them. Let it be something that you want. Let it be something that you crave is the gifts from God, especially that you may prophesy. 
And I'm going to hit this one a lot because prophecy is really at the core of everything. I said it last week. I'll say it again. Everybody in here should have the ability to prophesy. Everybody should be able to hear the voice of God and speak out what he says or do what he tells you to do. That is prophecy at his, his basic form. And it can go off in a lot of branches. We will talk about them. Again, I'm just I'm reiterating this because if someone ever comes and says, well, I don't know if that's prophecy, or I don't think everybody should prophesy. I'm telling you right now, everybody should be able to hear the voice of God and release it. It doesn't mean that it's going to be this long, drawn-out word. It doesn't mean that you're the next Isaiah and you're writing books and books and books of prophecy and foretelling and foreshadowing. It doesn't mean that. But it does mean that if you hear the voice of the Lord say, hey, I need you to go over to Joanne. I need you to tell her that I love her. That you're willing and able to hear him and walk over and repeat that in obedience. That is prophecy at its simplest form. So pursue love, earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. And then in Philippians 1, 9 through 11, Paul also says, it is my prayer. So Paul is praying for the Philippians that your love may abound more and more. Again, here we are with love. We got to have more and more love. He says that your love may abound more and more. So it's already abounding. It's already more than you can handle. And he says more and more with knowledge and all discernment. In, in my opinion, this is just my opinion. I can't justify it because when I start to think about all the gifts, I'm like, well, that one's more important. Well, that one's more important. Well, th that one's. I think discernment for me is like top three. Like, we have to be able to discern and know what's right and wrong. We have to be able to discern the spirits that are behind the gifts. Because I want to remind everyone for a second, demons are just fallen angels. They were once in heaven. They were once around the throne, and they chose wrong. But that doesn't make them, God didn't strip them of their abilities that he created them, just like he hasn't stripped us from our abilities. Just like he didn't take our free will away. Just like he didn't say, oh, Adam and Eve, you couldn't handle free will. I'm going to take that away from you. No. He created us to be who we are. It doesn't mean that there's not going to be judgment later. But these angels that are fallen angels that are demons, they can still operate in the same giftings and the same abilities that God gave them. And so we have to be able to discern, okay, hold on a second. This person is telling me something about myself, but it's making me feel gross. Is that from the Lord or is that from the enemy? Because there's a difference between correction and condemnation. And when the Lord comes in, he's going to bring correction and he's going to offer you the ability to repent and turn the other way and stop sinning. When the enemy comes in, he's going to bring conviction, and he's going to say, you're guilty, guilty, guilty. You deserve to go to, to hell. You deserve to go to prison. You're not worthy to do anything else. You need to go sit in the corner and be by yourself. And there is a difference. With knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of of our God. And so that's just a little foundation for where we are this morning. I believe as you're asking for the gifts, actually, we'll just take a really quick poll. So last week we ended service and we said, hey, if you want to come down front and you want to receive more gifts, you want the gifts wakened up again, um, come down front and we prayed for you. I I'm just curious, how many of you, and there there's no shame in this at all if you don't raise your hand, but this should be an encouragement. How many of you got to experience the gifts of the Spirit working in your life this week? Just a show of hands. This is super encouraging. Again, this is super encouraging. I love this. And hopefully week by week, more hands are going to start to go up. Because we want to be a church that is full of the gifts. Because if the gifts are flowing, that means the giver is in your life. That means, and if they're not flowing, it doesn't not mean that. Like, hear what I'm saying for a second. I don't want you to feel bad that you didn't just raise your hand here. But I want us to be aware and I want us to be more intentional. As we're waking up in the morning, God, use me today. Let me be your, your tool today. Let me minister where I go today. As you're pulling into a new place, okay, God, I know I got to go to the bank today. Would you just help me encourage the person behind the counter? And it might be something as simple as you just give them a little encouraging word, or it might be something like you read their mail, and now they're bawling behind the teller, <laughs> teller desk. But the moment you stop and you say, God, use me, I'm open. My vessel is open. Fill me up, Lord. Watch and see what happens. 
Watch and see what happens. All right, so Matthew 7, let's read. This is going to make a lot of sense in a moment, so stick with me. Matthew 7, verse 1. Judge not that you not be judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure that you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but did not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is a log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. Ask, and it will be given. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and to the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. Or which of you, if a son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? So, whatever you wish others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. So this is towards the tail end of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. He's sitting on the side of, uh, of a mountain. He's around the Sea of Galilee, and he is, he is just preached this incredible sermon with power and authority. And this is like his tail end closing. He's telling the people who are here, hey, don't judge others unless you want that same judgment that you're judging them with to be your measuring stick. And he's, then he goes on and he starts telling them, you're an evil person. If you're evil and you know how to give good gifts to your kids, how much more if your heavenly father who is pure and spotless and blameless has never done anything wrong, how much more of a good gift would he know how to give you? In fact, I, dare I say the gift may be perfect if he's the one who's giving it. And then he goes on and he says, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. He, he says that right after he talks about how a heavenly father gives good gifts. And again, he wasn't preaching and he didn't say, Okay, now on to my next point. Now on to my next point. And uh, scribe, will you mark a chapter marker in there? No. That's not how it worked. He's, he's one continuous flow in thoughts. Our headings in our Bible are a beautiful thing, but sometimes... In fact, I do it in my Bible software. I'll turn them off so I can just read the whole thing in one common dialogue. And so what we have here is Jesus is saying, as you're looking out on others, don't judge them unless you want to be judged for the way that you're using your gift. Know that the gifts come from your heavenly Father and they are perfect and they are excellent and they are worthy. And if you want more, ask, seek, and knock. If you see someone with a gift and you say, wow, I really am blown away at their ability to be merciful. Lord, would you make me more merciful? That's okay. Ask him. Seek out mercy. <laughs> Do you want more mercy? <laughs> Put yourself in a situation where you gotta, <laughs> gotta expend mercy. <laughs> that's, not, that's not fun. I gotta be honest. <laughs> so let's break this down a little bit. Let's look at our interaction with others. In verse 1, judge not that you not be judged. That word judge is the Greek word kreno. And it means to try or to condemn, to punish, or to determine something about someone. And, and this comes back to our friends last week, Mr. Hammer and Screwdriver. And if you missed it, you can go back and watch it online. But you can't have a screwdriver tell a hammer how to do his job. And likewise, you can't have a hammer tell a screwdriver how to do their job. If you do that, you end up with something really, really awkward. You end up with a, a lack of progress. And if, you, if screwdriver is doing what a hammer is supposed to do, I'm not going to trust that nail at the end of the day. I'm just not. And if a hammer is pounding a screw in, I'm not going to trust that screw. Because it's not doing what it was designed to do. It's not moving in its gifting of what it was decide, decided to do. Likewise, we look at the body. I... I don't want my lungs doing what my liver does. That's not fun. I don't want my stomach operating how my heart does. I don't want my stomach sitting there pulsing all day. That's not fun. If the stomach was like, ooh, I like how the heart goes thump, thump. I don't like it when my stomach does weird things. I don't want my stomach going thump, thump all day long. 
They're designed to do what they're designed to do. Likewise, if my heart was like, I'm really tired. The stomach looks chill over there. I'm just going to stop thumping. That's not good either. Everybody is designed to carry their giftings and operate in the way that God has deemed them to be. Um, so we're, we're not to judge and condemn and punish other people for their gifting. Well, that's not how you're supposed to use your mercy gift. Let me show you how to use your mercy gift, because I have a very strong prophetic gift of correction. So let me show you how to use your mercy gift. Those don't work well together. They actually balance each other out, and they need each other in those moments. In verse 5, Jesus says, You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Sometimes we can be so quick to point out to someone else, that's not how you use your gift. Stop you. You can't do your gift like that. And meanwhile, we're walking around not knowing a clue how to use our own gift. We've got this giant log protruding out of our eye where we don't understand how to use our gift. And we say, well, yes, I have the gift of mercy. I just choose when to use it. It's like men in selective hearing, right? We know, we know, we know, <laughs> we know when to use our hearing. Um, it's like that, and you're walking around, and you're saying, well, I have the gift of mercy. I've been really good. I've had people tell me all the time, I have a really good gift of mercy, so I know how to use the gift of mercy. And meanwhile, you're not having mercy on someone who's using their gift. And it's like you've got this giant log in your eye, and you're trying to find the littlest teeny speck. Or it's like you're trying to pull out a splinter from someone's finger, and you're wearing sunglasses. Like, it just doesn't work. It's, it's conflicting, and it's making things difficult. But that word hypocrite there, it means an actor under an assumed character. It's a pretender. It's an imposter. And so as we're, we're doing this, if you want to call someone out on their gifting, but yet you're struggling in your own gifting, and you're bringing criticism, not constructive criticism, but you're bringing con criticism, it is like you are an imposter. And I don't want us to walk around with our giftings and be imposters. And I'm going to put a, a, a pin in this, and in a few weeks we'll come back and we'll talk about what it means to test the spirits, because there is a testing of spirits that has to take place. You can't just let anyone come in and be like, well, I have the gift of prophecy, so I'm going to prophesy over everybody and, and like not try it, right? You have to test the prophecy, and, and you can't have someone come in and say, well, I'm generous, so I'm just going to give, 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 because a, a generous gift that's out of balance comes with strings attached. And so you can't have that either. That's how you, that's how you end up in a pickle. Fortunately, we don't have this. Um, I actually, none of our leadership team sees who tithes, who gives, or any of that stuff. We just see bulk numbers. And so the beauty of that is if someone comes to us and they say, well, uh, listen, Pastor Nathan, I see you've got all these projects going on. Uh, I'd be glad to donate a large sum of money if you'll uh, just put a plaque with my name right down front. We don't have that issue here because I don't know who gives what. Our leadership team has no idea who gives what, so we don't have that issue here. But you have a generous giver, and I've been around these people. They, they come, they love to give, they love to give, and they say, well, I will gladly give to this if you'll do this. Or they give, 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 and then later on something happens that they don't like. They're like, yeah, this sounds really loud, and, uh, you know, if we can't turn that down, I— think my tithe might be drying up. That's weird. That's not generosity. That's control. And so, so we, we, we are going to test those things, and we're just going to put a pin in that. We'll come back to it in a couple weeks, but I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. We don't want to come and judge one another and beat each other up and tell each other, you can't do that, you can't do that, you can't do that. Let's build each other up. Hey, I see that you were trying to use that gift of exhortation there, that you were trying to encourage how did that feel? And they might tell you, you know what? It felt incredibly awkward. Like, I just felt like I didn't know what I was doing. Oh, well, let's talk about it. You'd be surprised how often someone doesn't feel comfortable using their gift and how, uh, let's just do a quick poll. How many of you would say you feel uncomfortable using your spiritual gifts from time to time? Yeah. You saw me do it last week when I was like, oh, Lord, I feel like we're supposed to go somewhere. And I was like, okay, I'm jumping out. I felt uncomfortable, but I'm so thankful that I did. Now, we are told by God to desire the gifts. We see in Scripture that He desires to give us gifts for His purpose. What we should not do is desire to have the gifts in order that we may achieve some status or platform. And I've been there. 
I've done that. Uh, being a young man, God, I just want to be a pastor. Wow, what a mistake. You ask for something that you don't understand the fullness of. And so at age 15, I'm sitting here thinking, yes, Lord, I'll answer the call. Send me wherever you want to go. Let me be a pastor. Well, then all of a sudden, all my friends started coming up to me with all their problems. God, I don't like this. This is not fun, right? He's like, well, Nathan, you said you wanted to be a pastor. What? Yeah, I, I, I did say that, didn't I? You know, but there's a process that he takes you through, and then I had to start learning, okay, God, give me a pastor's heart. Because flesh, Nathan, <laughs> doesn't like to deal with it. And you try to take on burdens for yourself, and you try to, you, you're like, you desire these giftings, and then you try to operate them in yourself, and you're trying to make a name for yourself, and you're trying to achieve status. I've been there. I've done that. It doesn't work. It burns you out. It dries you up. It makes you go to a desert place that you don't want to be in. And desert places are good when the Lord calls you. When the Holy Spirit calls you into the desert, that's different. When you run into the desert willingly, <laughs> that's just dumb. <laughs> We should not covet gifts or envy gifts because someone else has them. As we're around each other, sometimes, sometimes it's, it's actually wild. My wife carries an incredible anointing, the, the breaker anointing. So I love praying with her. And so one thing I, I love that I could get jealous of, but I choose not to because it's really good, is if we're praying for someone and I start praying, it's almost like, a, and then she starts praying. And then it's like the heavens open up and it's like God is just dumping words of knowledge in. And so she's praying and I'm like, whoa, 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 like trying to scribe things down. And then she finishes and I'm just like, boom, here's what God's saying. Now I could be jealous and I could say, God, why can't you let me do that? I want to be the breaker. But then how fun would that be? I wouldn't get to do ministry with my wife. But because she's the breaker, and I get to be the one to hear it, and, then, and it's just fun. Like, we tag team back and forth. And so while she's praying, the Lord's downloading, and I'm, I'm proclaiming when she finishes. And then while I'm praying over them and proclaiming things, she's getting more. And it's just like this beautiful tag team. And guess what? We're not in competition. We're helping each other. We're moving together. We are in one accord. And what happens when you get in one accord? The Spirit of God begins to flow. He begins to fall. That's what happened on the day of Pentecost. They were in one mind and one accord, and the wind of heaven came blowing through. The fire of God fell. That's what we want. We want to be in one accord. Gifts are meant to edify and build up the church, not divide it. So if you start seeking gifts and it starts to, to give you this bad feeling towards someone or it makes you envious or jealous of them, you got to check your heart. You go look in the mirror and you say, hey, you— What's your motivation right now? And you check yourself. So then moving forward in verse 7, let's look at how we're to interact with God. So if that's how we're interacting with others, we're to love them, we're not to judge them, we're not to be hypocritical, let's look at how we're supposed to interact with God. He says in verse 7, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. The word ask there means to beg, to call for, to crave, or desire. I highlighted those words myself, high, uh, crave and desire, that we would crave and desire the gifts. Jesus tells us this right here. When he says, ask, ask, ask and it will be given you. Crave these giftings, desire these giftings. Seek, it's a word that means to worship God. Again, to desire him, to go on and endeavor, to inquire of him. Do you want to know more about the gifts? Seek him. Seek him. Lord, show me what it means to be a pastor. Show me what it means to be an evangelist. Show me what it means to be merciful. Show me what it means to have an administrative gift. Lord, show me what it means to be a craftsman filled with your spirit. Lord, show me what it means to be wisdom, have wisdom. Seek him out and knock. This one was interesting to me because it's actually more of a physical, um, physical thing. In fact, the, the word that it is tied into is uh, a physical striking. So it's almost like you're saying, this is what I want. You're, you're, you're laying your, your moment down. You're putting a stake in the ground and you're saying, it, it's almost like Jacob when he's wrestling with God, I won't let you go until you bless me. 
God, I want to know mercy. God, I want to know compassion. That's what he's saying. Knock. Come at it with some, with some fire behind you. Not this, this sheep is like, well, Lord, if it, if it be your will, and maybe if you would consider it after uh, a few different things, if, if, it, if it might bestow upon you, Lord, and all your wisdom, would you, just, would you just bless me with mercy? He's saying, come and grab me. Tell me what you want, son. There's another parable he uses where he talks about the friend that wakes up in the middle of the night and he's knocking on his door. I, I shared about it a few weeks ago, and oh my gosh, I, who came up and told me about communion? Was it you, Micah? The, the friend asked for three loaves of bread <laughs> because it represents communion. Because on a Passover, there was three cakes of bread, and one of them was broken, and my mind was just blown. And here's, how, here's why I bring that up, because that is Eucharist, or the Eucharisto, or Thanksgiving, which again, the, the root word of that is Cairo. We're talking about all the same thing. When you feast on his presence, when you feast on his bread, when you consume him, when you consume his word, that is you asking, seeking, knocking, and his presence begins to flow through you. It is all tied to the same thing. That is why he said, do this in remembrance of me. As often as you think of me, take communion. Something I'm starting, I'm realizing in this moment right now is there's people in here that I know take communion daily. And it's, it's not a coincidence that these people have the gifts of God flowing in their life daily. It's tied together. If you want to start somewhere, start consuming his body. Start drinking his wine in the morning. Grab a cracker. Grab some juice. Start taking communion daily and watch the gifts begin to flow through you because you're consuming him. You're becoming one with him. Jesus gives us clear and explicit instructions that if we are desiring something from God, we are to ask, seek, and knock. The Lord desires to give each of us with his gifts, yet he wants us to ask for them. Yes, there are some that you are, you're born with, and it's, it's just the way that, that God made you, but there are others that he's like, come on, ask. You want more? Ask. Now he's going to sharpen you. If, if you're not sharp enough, he's going to sharpen you. If you're not refined enough to handle a gift, he's going to refine you. If you have not been pressed enough to, to carry the anointing, he's going to press you more. But it's worth it every time. It's worth it every time. To see the gift of God flow in my life and see lives changed and, and look back at him, not me, is, is incredible. That we even have the opportunity to be ambassadors for him. Now understand this, asking, seeking, knocking is not always instant. Sometimes it is. I'll share a story about that. Um, when I was a young adult, we used to do treasure hunting evangelism. Has anyone ever done this, treasure hunting evangelism? And so before you go out, you pray and you say, okay, Lord, what are we going after? What's our target? Who are we looking at? What are we, what are we looking to heal? And sometimes the Lord will give you street names. He gave us street names. Uh, sometimes he would tell us, hey, there's a guy. He's going to be wearing an orange hoodie with a blue baseball cap. And sure enough, we'd go downtown and we'd find a guy with an orange hoodie and a blue baseball cap. And be like, you, we're calling you out. You know, and so then you get this bunch of weirdos come up that say they saw you. You know, I'm just kidding. We didn't, we didn't tell them, oh, we saw you before. Because that is a weird way to say hello to someone. Um, but the Lord would show us things instantly. And so he would give us a word of knowledge. He would give us a little vision. He would give us um, words of wisdom to speak to these people. The gift of healing was present. And so what would happen is uh, we'd go out, and then all of a sudden, boom, 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 everything that we had prayed for that the Lord confirmed is just being confirmed right then and there. Now, I've seen where this can get out of balance and get, get a little weird. Um, but honestly, when you seek the Lord and you say, God, what's this? And you go and you do what he says and you're seeing people converted to Christ. They want to be discipled. They're getting discipled. That is the great commission. When you see the gifts active and working and moving. And, and I love it when they don't always function in here and they're functioning out in the middle of just a random street. When you've got people that are unsuspecting and all of a sudden the presence of the Lord walks up and now their mail is being read or they walked in with a limp and now they're, they're healed. They were blind, but now they're seeing. They're, they're released from demons. They're, they're totally healed and delivered on a spiritual aspect of it. That is just 
amazing. And so that is where we want to be. It doesn't mean that it's always going to happen instantly like that. Sometimes you have to petition for a gift, and that's okay. But just know if you're, if you're asking the Lord for something, and he put that desire in your heart, don't give up. Don't give up. So let's talk real quick about God, the gift giver. In James 1.16, it says, Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from where? Above coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. This should encourage us. God does not change. He doesn't. We sang about it. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's the God who was, who is, and is to come. There is no variation in him. It's not like, oh, I got Thursday God today. Oh, I got Monday God today. That's not how he operates. He is faithful and true. He is consistent. He is not wavering. So when you come to him, he's going to give you the same answer. And so if he tells you, hey, you're not ready for that gift yet, he's not going to change the ball on you. I was talking to a friend who was having some medical work done, and, and every time he came back to the doctor, they kept changing the numbers on him. They're like, oh, well, this is, this is actually healthy now. Well, this is actually healthy now. Well, this, this is actually healthy now. I'm like, what kind of system is this? It, it, you can't change it like that. God says, here's my righteous standard. It's there. It's, it's solid. It's not changing. It's not moving. In Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forevermore. Psalm 85, 12, yes, the Lord will give what is good and our land will yield its increase. It's the Lord who brings the increase. John 3, 27, Jesus is talking to Nicodemus and um, no. John 3, 27, John answered, a person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given from heaven. We cannot receive anything unless it comes from him. If we are operating in another gift or something that is not from him, it's wrong, plain and simple. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Every good gift comes from him. Every good gift will point back to him because they are from him. We can't help but point back to him when we're operating in our gifts in a healthy way. The gifts help us to understand Jesus. Um, I got to read a long passage because it's one entire thought. And when you read it, just look for the period. It's just a bunch of commas. Ephesians 1, 16 through 21. Paul says, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him having the eyes of your hearts enlightened that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, which are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe, according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also to the one who is to come. Now, the reason I read that whole thing to you is to help you understand where Paul started in that. He said, I pray that the Lord, the Father of glory, may give you what? the spirit of wisdom and revelation and knowledge of him. I believe what happened when Paul was writing that was as he wrote that out, God just dropped a bomb on him and he couldn't stop writing the thought. And so he starts writing about this revelation that he's getting of Jesus. And he's like, he is all this, he's all that. He was dead here and he's seated in heavenly places and he reigns in glory. And he just keeps going on and on and on and on. But because God gave him the gift of revelation, the gift of knowledge, the gift of wisdom in that moment was the only way that he was able to have that true revelation of Jesus Christ. You want to know Jesus more? Ask for the gifts. Ask for the gift of revelation. Something I started doing last year when I would open the word, I said, God, just open my eyes. Reveal something new to me in this book. Reveal something new to me in this word. Show me something I didn't see before. Connect the dot I didn't see before. Show me your son in this book. I have yet to find a passage that does not point back to Jesus. It's all about him. It is all about him. I want to share an example of when God is not the giver, and then, uh, then I'm going to wrap up for today. In Acts chapter 8. 
We meet a guy named Simon. So it says, but there was a man named Simon who had previously practiced magic in the city and amazed all the people of Samaria, saying that he himself was somebody great. They all paid attention to him from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is the power of God that is called great. And they paid attention to him because for a long time he had amazed them with his magic. But when they believed Philip as he preached the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Even Simon himself believed. And after being baptized, he continued with Philip. And seeing signs and great miracles performed, he was amazed. Now, when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John, who came down and prayed from them that they might receive the Holy Spirit, for he had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Praise God. Now, when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right with God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours, and pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. And Simon answered, pray for me to the Lord that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. When your motivation for the gifting is wrong, you end up like Simon. You end up practicing witchcraft, which is taking things into your own hands and controlling the situation and wanting the glory for yourself. Simon tried to offer money so that he could, again, receive this gift because I, I, I believe what he was caught in was paying other people to teach him his magic tricks. And this would have been common for him. He Notice something, though. Even the great one, the great magician, was humbled by the mighty power of God. In 1 Corinthians 4, um, I had it and I, I did not put it in this study. But I just want to read it. At the end of 1 Corinthians 4, Paul says in verse 19, But I will come to you soon, if the Lord wills, and I will find out not the talk of these arrogant people, but their power. For the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. That is how Paul operated. That is how the apostles operated. That is how the early church operated. Don't tell me a good thing. Don't just tickle my ears. Don't tell me how good your gift is. Show me the power. Because when you show the power, discernment becomes really easy. You you begin to quickly see who's powering them. Is it power from the Lord or is it power from the enemy? Who's being glorified? Who's being edified in that moment? So Simon hears the gospel. He's baptized in water. Then he sees the real power of God. He sees the Holy Spirit and he tries to cut God out of the equation and he tries to offer money. Instead of asking, whoa, what's going on here? How is this working? He says, I will just give you money. Just give me the gift so that I can lay hands on people. What he failed to see was that the Holy Spirit was not to elevate the person to a place of power, but it was to elevate God. It was to elevate man in his relationship with God. Our love for others should be the motivation for our gifts. I know it sounds very simple and foundational, and I don't mean to offend those of you that have been around much longer than me and have operated in your giftings longer than I've been alive. But I believe if we're all to move together in this next season and see the gifts move, we should be speaking the same language. And so as we speak the same language, we have to understand that our gifts, our motivation is to be for others, that others may see the power of God working that others may see God glorified, that others may have a greater revelation of Jesus because of the gift at work in us. If we miss the importance of love as we engage and practice spiritual gifts, we may find ourselves like Simon, where it was told to him, your heart is not right before God. I don't want to end up like Simon. 
I don't want to end up like Samson, who didn't even know that the Holy Spirit had departed from him. We don't want to end up in an Ichabod state where the glory of the Lord has departed. We want to stay humble. We want to stay low. We want to stay open to the moving of of the Spirit of God. We want to use his giftings to point others back to him. Can you stand with me? In closing, in his fullness, in his love is fullness of joy. Jesus is talking with his disciples the night before he's to be crucified in John 15. And um, he's pouring out everything he can. In fact, can you guys just make your way down here? We're going to close out together. I got one last illustration for you guys. Don't be worried. I promise. Just make your way on down here. Come in close. That's that's close. That's close enough, sir. (laughs) Uh, I love it. But the night before, Jesus is pouring out everything he can to his disciples before he's about to be crucified because he knows what they're about to go through on their side. They're about to lose the one that they love. They're about to watch the, their rabbi be crucified on a tree. And uh, he's just talked to them about the vine and the branches and how they have to abide in him. You cannot do anything apart from Jesus. You cannot do anything apart from the Lord. You have to abide in him. And in John 15, verse 10, it says, If you keep my commandments... You will abide in my what? My love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love, these things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. That word joy is another one of our words and it's the the word kara. And it means joy, but it's one of the 12 words that again comes out of the word Cairo. And so as we're going through these giftings, when we're using our giftings, there should be a joy that overflows. Oh, but what if I have to give a corrective prophetic word? When you read the prophetic words that are corrective, notice there's always a correction and then a, if you do this, here's what will happen. There's joy at the end. If you will correct your course, my presence will begin to flow again. If you will seek my face yet again, I will come and dwell in your midst. Joy, 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 joy. I want you to look around the room. See, I I got everybody here together. We are here for one another. We are here to love one another. We are on the same team. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm on the same team. We have a common enemy. And it's not a single person in this room. Amen. Our enemy is the devil. We're going to come against him and we are going to take back those that he has tried to steal. And we are going to ask the Lord to use us in whatever way and whatever means possible to see his glory, to see heaven here on earth, to see those that were lost come back home, to see those that are lost get saved. We are on the same team. So if there's anyone in here and you're feeling like, well, I'm alone. I feel like I got nobody. Look around. You've got somebody. Don't run off and be an island by yourself. Don't run away. You've got people. Grab someone. Even even in this moment, if you're feeling alone, grab someone and just say, "Can can I just have a hug? That sounds simple, but sometimes that's what we need. I can't tell you how many times I've walked into one of our leadership meetings. There's six of us in there. And one of us is like, hey guys, I'm just, I'm just feeling really alone. And then everybody else is like, me too. And yet we're sitting there thinking, there's no way the others are feeling alone. But the enemy's a liar. And he wants you to feel alone so that he can divide and conquer. And that's just not it. We are together. So link arms, grab shoulders, grab hands, whatever is acceptable for the people around you. <laughs> Father, I thank you that we stand together. I thank you that we are one. Father, I pray that you would bring us even more into one accord with you. One accord with you, Lord Jesus. You at the head, we are your body, moving in one accord. We wait for orders from headquarters. 
God, we will move and we will do and we will say what you want us to say. So Lord, we pray that love would begin to flow in us, in this church, that this would be a house known for its love for one another. God, that we would see one another, that we would elevate one another, that we would lift up one another, praising one another, celebrating one another's giftings, God. We are not an island. We are not on our own. We are together. We are an army coming against the schemes and the wiles of the enemy. So Father God, I pray for those that feel alone. I pray that you would wrap your loving arms around them, God. We squash the lies of the enemy. We come against deception. We come against the the thoughts that no one loves me, no one cares for me. We come against that right now and we speak truth. We speak truth. We are a family, a full family, and we will leave the 99 to go after the one. So Lord, I just pray your love would begin to flow in us, that we would be moving in your love, that we would abide in your love, that we would rest and desire and crave your love, Lord Jesus, that it would just ooze out of us. And Father, we just pray again for a continual explosion of your gifts in our congregation, Lord, that you would teach us, teach us, Lord, how to use your gifts. You have the instruction manual, God. We look to you for how to use our giftings, God. I pray that you would refine our giftings. Lord, I pray for those that are seasoned in their giftings, Lord. Would you give them an ability to come alongside others and teach and learn and grow and mentor them? Father, I pray that you would humble us, that we would be able to ask you for more gifts. Even when we think we've got all the gifts that we need, God, would you show us where we are in lack? Oh, Jesus. And I pray a blessing over this body, those here in person and those online. Would you renew our minds today? Would you fill us with your spirit? We bless you, King Jesus, in the mighty name. Amen. Amen. Ah. Be blessed as you go throughout your week. May your joy be full, full of joy. Amen.